Hey, welcome back to Garbro's Field Desk. I have for you chapter 14 of section 222. And as always, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel as well as check out our coffee link where you can donate money to the channel because YouTube does not give us anything because we don't meet certain guidelines and regulations. As well, check out Redcon 1 for all your dietary and workout needs for while you're going through your journey in the gym and taking yourself to a more healthy aspect in life. Hopefully, today, me and my VA team earn your dollar. So let's get on to it. Chapter 14, Fighting Cobras with Fire. Dragonfly 1, southwest bound from Anthoraz. How long should this fuel last us, Fibbin? Groon asked, looking to his left to view the other two A-37s as they all cruised in the direction of oars. Fibbin pulled out her notebook, looked at the gauges, then consulted her map to do more math. Hmm, well, with us cruising on a single engine, we'll have full combat range. Actually... We may have to dump fuel to avoid being too slow. Good to hear. Shame we had to take on those external tanks and not strap on more dragonfire. Groon murmured, giving his stick a slight wiggle. The two other A-37s wiggled as well. We have enough canisters for six drops, and we should focus on the enemy artillery before we start on the infantry. Fibbin said, opening up her map a little more than consulting her reports. Brush-feathered scouts report that they are actively watching their emplacements. No anti-air except for the possibility of missiles. But, we hear flares. Groon clicked the button on his flight stick for the radio. Gilly, Soup, you two aware of our first strike? Nah. Gilly said, the dwarf looking over to Groon's plane. Are we not just attacking the infantry? Soup asked, her long horn jutting out of the hole they had to cut into her helmet. Groon chuckled. You ought to kick on the mic and let them know what Orr's command asked us. How do they not already know? They were with us when we landed in Anthorez to get to the fuel tanks. Fibbin growled, setting down her map and flipping through her notebook. Oh, don't be too surprised. They're excited. First air to ground attack from our folks as we launched that mage via catapult at the Fey. Fibbin snorted. Ah, <laughs> oh, yes. Old Yamahest, the deranged. Not only did he kill with his spells, but his body was found having crushed an orc to death by pure body weight. To be fair, he was rather fat for an elf, Groon said with a rumbling laugh. To be fair... Fibbin said, drawing out the R and then clicking on the radio with her own co-pilot joystick. Alright, let me tell you again what we're doing. I remember completely, but I'll let you tell me if it'll make you feel better. Gilly said, and Fibbin could see both he and his co-pilot Jolly laughing from under their helmets and beards. Soup clicked on her mic. Don't let B for brains fool you. We were both too busy looking at the map to hear what was coming out of the radio operator's mouth. Do me a favor and say it a little slower too, so Gilly can pick it up. Oh, fuck off, you only midget. Gilly barked through his mic. The teasing laughter of Soup crackled over Fibbin's headset. Shout for an Oni, but still tall enough to reach the shelves you can't! Oh, ha, ha. Gilly said dryly. Fibbin clicked on her mic and cleared her throat pointedly. Ahem. <clears throat> anyway, we'll be approaching from Oz North, but our main attack path is going to be west of Oz in the trees. We have to time this well as the brush feathered scouts are sitting not even 30 feet away from the enemy artillery. The hair flares... And when we are a minute out, they will pop the flares and then fly as fast as they can from the target area. How are they arranged? The artillery, I mean. Soup asked, and Fibbin saw her valley of co-pilot pulling out his own map, pencil in hand. It appears the humans and southern elves are comfortable being in a single line. They don't know we have a tech craft and are using the little roadways behind the artillery to quickly transport ammunition up and down their lines. Fibbin said, running a finger along her notebook as she read as well as looking at the map. 
Crown and Gilly are gonna run tandem coming in low and fast following the flare line. Dragonfire canisters will toast things up nicely and effectively cripple their artillery. Soup? You'll see a bundle of red flares near the edge of the city. These are apparently mortar dugouts. Should I use the gun or the canisters? Soup asked, slowly swaying her A37 side to side. If I can nose down right on top of them with my engines cut from high altitude, I can turn them all to Swiss cheese thanks to the night vision modules the gremlin has. Would you allow me to keep a canister to drop on something else? If you think you can pinpoint those mortars, do so, Groon said, then tilted his head towards Gilly's craft. Gilly, we'll go in side by side and coat those bastards in flames. They won't be able to hide. There's also a supply point at the very tip of the artillery line. We could hit that with our guns. Fibbins said, tipping at the end of the point on her map. Our supply point already got hammered into oblivion. It would do us well to even the odds as much as we can. Gilly clicked on his mic. Their supply points got blown up. Yep. Fibbins said, folding her map back up, then she turned to Groon. Hate not being able to eat or drink before our flight. Fucking starving. If you want to eat, be prepared to lay clay in one of those waterfall bags. Groon said with a smirk. Fibbin glowered at him, but did look longingly at the small sack of ranger bars hanging from a hook on the dash. If their supply dumps got destroyed, how long are they gonna last then? We won't be there until well after half an hour after nightfall. Gilly mused over the mic, while in the other A-37, Soup shrugged. Part of the problem with Ventura is coming upon us. Shorter dates, knowing how fast a combat can chew through ammunition. They'll be dry before we get there. Soup said, and Fibbin could see the Oni tapping her lip and thought. Not to mention the Fey would be crazy to not attack as soon as night falls. Groon said, now frowning. Fibbin went to add in her own thoughts on the matter when another voice crackled up onto their flight frequency. Donut Dolly Flight to Dragonflight 1. This is Dragonflight 1. Go ahead. Fibbin said, pulling out her notebook and plucking her pencil from her ear. Groon clicked on his mic with a wry smile. Is that Cartwheel I hear? Groon? They let you into the lead plane? Cartwheel said, laughter thick in his voice. Groon laughed, then clicked his mic back on. Who else would they trust to keep these harpies flying in a straight line? What are you up here in? Number nine, escorting a gaggle of Hueys to a staging point a few miles outside Oars. Cartwheel said, and Groon could hear his gunner fussing in the background with something. They're loaded to the gills with medical supplies and ammo, but won't be able to land until we clear the air. A woman's voice cut in on the radio. They got us loaded so heavily that I feel like a stuffed wheat cocker. Every gust of wind makes us drop a couple feet. Funny, I could have swore we all felt and flew like Grosshead's mother. Another voice piped up, and the radio filled with laughter over the chatting retorts of Grasshead. Looks like you and I will be the ones going in first. Likely I'll make a long pass over the city to see where I'm needed. Cartwheel said, his voice turning grim. But I must admit, I have eyes for another. Groon cut his eyes to Fibbin as he pressed on the button, and she raised her brows in response. And what might this another be? The Apache. Cartwheel said with a defiant tone. Humans have brought forth one of their modern war rotors. Likely crewed by humans who have seen combat before. <sighs> Sounds like suicide. Fibbin breathed out, but Groon glared at her. Are you sure that's a good idea, Cartwheel? There are still multiple cobras to deal with, Groon said, his voice tentative. And we only have one airframe of the Cheyenne up and running, and you're in it. It is destiny that we should meet there. I will prove we are better than these humans. Cartwheel said, biting out the words in a challenge. The female Huey pilot from before spoke up. Well, before you go off challenging veteran human Apache pilots, make sure to at least scare off the Cobras so us lowly Hueys can touch down, okay? Okay. Damn Oni pilots. Cartwheel growled as the rest of the Huey pilots sniggered and giggled into their mics. Soup keyed on her mic. What's wrong with the Oni pilots? Hmm? 
Oh, for fuck's sake, it's Soup. Cartwheel said with an air of annoyance, and Groon could see both Soup and her co-pilot laughing with open mouths. Anyway, how far are you from your rally point? Groon asked. Infibin opened up her map with a flourish of annoyance. Cartwheel didn't reply for a moment as he conferred with his gunner. After a couple minutes, his voice filled Groon's ears. We'll be taking off around the time you arrive, landing ten minutes outside oars in a field. Give or take a few minutes. We'll all be in the air after dark, though. So we'll have first pass at the enemy. We'll be trying to track fast movers as Cartwheel comes in low and slow, Groon murmured. Fibbin nodded, folding her map back up after making annotations. It would be better to all attack at once, but they'll need all the help they can get once the combat starts. Thirty minutes. Do you think they can last that long when the ammo runs dry? Groon asked Fibbin, a small needle of dread working its way into his chest. Fibbin settled back against her seat as the wind buffeted her A-37. I don't know, really. There are militia down there with good old-fashioned steel. Maybe that can buy enough time? Or it won't and we'll be just spitting down into the wind. Hmm. Groon rumbled in his throat, then set his eyes on the darkening horizon. Section 222. Two, two. Oars. Saza, do you have a spare magazine? Helena screamed over the roar of the fire engulfing the multi-storied home beside her. Saza cursed and ducked down behind the shattered T-214 Dodge truck that they were all using for cover. A what? Magazine! Helena screamed again, holding up her last empty one for him to see. Saza patted himself down along his chest rig and pockets, then looked over his shoulder. Ugh, no. I'm all out. Staff Sergeant, got a mag? Saz's own staff sergeant, a rugged valley elf, father to almost twelve children, tightened a bandage wrapped around his arm with his teeth. Magazine? Hell, boy, can't you see everyone putting on their bayonets? Helena leaned forward to look down the ragged, weaving battle line to see that every auxiliary was slotting their bayonets onto their lugs. She looked to her right and saw that Elda Hinda had drawn out one of her dwarven fighting daggers and a pistol, her mouth set in a grim line. Are you serious? This is it? That's all the fucking ammo we had? Helena said with frustration, looking around at the dry battalion's worth of troopers dug in at various points. Elda Hinda blew her hair out of her face, then leaned up to look around the wrecked truck. Afraid so. Most of the ammo went to the city fight and the southern ring. We were left with the dregs. We burned through it in only 15 minutes! Helena cried out in exasperation, finding a single magazine on the ground with six rounds in it. Limick pulled out his last two grenades, holding them in his fists. 210 rounds on average per soldier. We had a few crates set back. That should have kept us going for at least an hour. Are you two forgetting what the last 15 minutes has been? Elda Henda said, jabbing her pistol towards a large open field before them. I know you were all fully aware of how many bodies they were throwing at us. Helena grimaced as she looked around the bumper of the truck. The field was littered with thousands of bodies. Half of them orc while the rest reminded her of the battle elements from Tallweet, a scattering of races loyal to the southern elves and the fae. Some of them even had charged with rifles, though their aim was poor and didn't do much but cause them to duck their heads from time to time. They had come in waves through the dark, lunging out of the shadows like shades only a few feet from the entrenched gun line. Helena turned to ask Limic something, but was bodily tackled by a once again blood-soaked Vitka, both of them rolling along the ground. Get down! Vitka cried out looking up at the sky with wide eyes. Helena scrambled along with Vitka against the ruined truck as the thudding chop of rotor blades thundered overhead. Around them, other Himalaya harpies and recon units slammed into the ground with speed, either rolling with the impact or just staying flat and hugging the ground for all they were worth. The Cobra itself streaked over the roofs of oars and popped into view, its rotary gun spitting death and destruction into the battle line. Infantry screamed or went to scream, but were cut short as their bodies exploded into meat and blood as the explosive warheads cooked off inside of them. The helicopter turned and fired off a salvo of rockets, 
peppering a medical half-track with munitions until it completely exploded. A medic too slow to run for cover was belted across the chest by a piece of the rended armor plating. The female Oni being ripped in two messily and thudding wetly across the ground in a cartwheel of limbs and organs. A nearby warcaster watched as the Oni's body came to a rest, her intestines trailing behind her like twine unwinding from a yarn ball. Specialist Seldan, a brim touch hailing from the cold north of the silent stretch, flashed her eyes in rage, ripping off her uniform top as she strode out towards the hovering cobra. You son of a bitch. You fucking son of a bitch. Selden, get down! Makarat shouted, sitting up from the other side of Eldahinda. It'll kill you! Hardly! Seldan bellowed and used her canines to rip ragged gashes in the palms of her hands. With a flourish, the brim touched of the silent stretch slammed her bleeding palms together. Get down here, you fucking bastard! I wish to have a word. Selden, no! Makarat screamed, going to stand until Eldahinda tackled her to the ground. Helena watched with vidka and fascination as the cobra shuddered, tugged towards the ground for a moment and thrown off its firing pattern for the mortar teams who were all diving for cover. The craft was so close that Helena could see the pilot and gunner yelling to each other, trying to figure out what was going on. Get down here. Seldan screamed, then wrenched her hands towards herself. As the cobra shrugged down again, Helena could see that Seldan was casting some kind of wind magic, sucking the helicopter down towards the ground and making it fight for control. An owl harpy of the second wing scout unit, who had been flattening himself to the ground, looked up to see that he was, in fact, not dead yet, and whipped his head around, seeing specialist Seldan working against the cobra. The Owl Harpy saw the gun turret spinning towards Seldan, quickly bit down onto his wing claw, then threw his hand out towards the cockpit. The gunner! Turn gunner here! Seldan cried out with the effort, twisting her palms, but the Cobra twisted just enough to allow the Owl Harpy's sight of the gunner. Got you! He screamed and clenched his wing claw so fiercely the knuckles paled. The gunner opened his mouth in a silent yell, his body seething as if he had been hit by a taser. Lemmick! Lemmick, your grenade! Helena called out, then hauled Vitka to her feet. Vitka, can you fly over and throw a grenade into the engine? Vitka cackled maniacally as Lemmick shuffled over, holding up his grenade. Vitka can be pretty good throw. Here, Vitka. Lemmick said taking the harpy's wing talon and placing the grenade in it. Got it? Got it! Vitka said and opened her wings. Just throw it. Limic growled, ripping out the pin just before Vitka took off in flight, streaking towards the struggling cobra now only 25 feet or so from the ground. Specialist Seldan screamed in manic fury as she continued to pull the cobra down, the rotor wash throwing her long hair about her in a chestnut crown of strands. She narrowed her eyes at the gunner when they made eye contact, the two instantly recognizing the danger that loomed before them. The gunner seemed to feverishly jerk his head and arms, causing the turret to twitch inch by inch towards Cell Dan as he also tried to punch his hands towards the joystick's fire controls. The Owl Harpy cried out, jerking across the ground with each movement as if he was tied to the helicopter with string. Losing! Vitka swooped up twirling in a rush of wings as she tried to torpedo through the rotor wash. The gunner's finger had just managed to depress the trigger when the grenade thrown into their engine intake detonated, Vitko whirling through the air in a barrel roll as the entire exhaust cowling blew away with a gout of black smoke and metal. The Cobra slammed into the ground with a flop, flop, flop of its blades chopping into the dirt and disintegrating. The skids bent and mangled from the force of the impact. The gunner, perhaps in desperation, held down the hammer on the rotary gun, the rounds flying just to the left of Cell Dan and causing her hair to cascade around her face. Burn. Cell Dan murmured to herself and whipped her hands back around, dragging the flames from the burning half track and causing it to rise into the air in a funnel. With a flick of her hands, the funnel came down from the sky and plunged onto the cobra, 
The flames scouring along the glass cockpit and buckled steel armor in a hungry vortex. Seldan kept working the fire around the Cobra, and Helena could see through streams of flame the pilot and gunner screaming in terror, clawing at their gear as they were cooked alive within the cockpit. Watch out for the others! Sergeant Allen bellowed as he ran by Seldan, the Adorn punching his palm into the opposite wrist that held a striker a small pointed piece of gold that broke the flesh easily. Seldan ignored him, continuing to turn the cobra into a blackened, hissing ruin, the cockpit glass rippling like water under the heat. Sergeant Allen shook his head and held up his hand, reweaving the barriers that had grown weak since the battle had begun, worn down from the probing by the enemy helicopter. They work through it far faster than harpies, that's for sure. Thought we'd still be hidden for a while more. Vitka landed down next to Helena and held up her wing just under her eyes. Vitka gave Cobra bird degree burns. <laughs> yes, he did. Limix said with a laugh, tucking the pin into his chest pocket. Vitka laughed, clapping her wing claws together excitedly. Helena see Vitka roll on the rotors, toss grenade into engine like egg and whoosh, right on the rotor. <sighs> Good job, Vitka. Helena said with a relieved laugh bringing the harpy in for a hug. As the harpy's blood-soaked feathers made an audibly squishy noise against Helena's uniform, she pulled away with a grimace. Oh, for Vitka, really? Vitka laughed again. Oh yeah, Vitka came over to tell Helena about approaching army. Approaching what? Eldahinda roared, whipping around to look at Vitka at the same time a war horn bellowed out in the distant dark. Talk about a short-lived victory. Helena said dourly as she mounted the ruined truck to peer out into the darkness. Helena could make out a line of dark shapes, took aim with the scavenged Daewoo K2, and lobbed the last rounds of her magazine into the dark, watching three shapes drop to the grass. Estimations? Eldahinda asked, holstering her pistol and pulling out her other blade. Helena pulled off her bow and an arrow from her leg quiver. Looks like a massive horde out there in the dark. <sighs> Bulk of the orcs and other conventional forces, likely. Limix said, breathing out in a sigh. Yep. Vidka said happily, beaming with bared, smiling fangs. Limix scowled at the little shreds of flesh in between her teeth. Did you by chance see how many were coming our way? Thousands. Vidka said, raising her wing claws up as if this was good news. Orcs, brim touch, and local volley elves. Lots of bows and cavalry. Splendid. Limix said dryly. Turning to look at Eldahinda. I'll go talk to the martyrs. It's all prearranged. Eldahinda said, setting off at a jog. As the enemy warhorn bellowed again from the dark, an answering call echoed out from further in the firebase, and a unified marching of armored boots began to fill the air. This is the guard? Helena asked, pre knocking her first arrow, then clutching three more in her fist. Limick nodded. Old patchwork of different units and garrisons gathered this morning. It could be enough to stem the tide. Maybe. Helena took in the sight of the column as it strode out from the center of the base. Dozens of different banners fluttering in the smoke-stained wind. Royal Guard units, their steel plate armor blazing in the light of multiple burning vehicles, stood at the front, many of which wielded autoglaves and halberds. Behind them were the more rugged country guard, leather and chainmail forming the bulwark of their armor. Near the back, militia kept in step, wielding and wearing anything from rifles with bayonets to pots and pans. Roughly 2,000 men and women of almost every race and almost every creed from lawmen to bakers began to fan out, forming a line just behind the already ragged gun line of the auxiliaries. The horns bellowed their challenges to each other over the open, body-strewn ground, and Helena watched as the enemy battle line slowly emerged from the dark. Helena sucked in a breath as the battle line of orcs and humans closed the distance, as these humans were huge, broad-shouldered folk that looked as if they were born in the sunshine. Remind you of anyone? Limick said, less in question than more in a broad statement. Saza nodded, handing his last health potion to his NCO. One of ours. The big one. 
The big one made himself known with a guttural yell. Helena turned her head to watch as the ranks of the guard parted and both the Maori and the Sons of Odin came into view, all three of them looking livid at what was standing before them in the dark. Helena actually jumped when the Maori barked out something in an odd, flowing language, slapping his chest as he strode forward past the other two humans beside him. What in the fuck language is that? Helena asked in alarm as the other humans reacted to it viscerally, all of them shouldering forward as well, golden torques shining around their necks. Limic watched, eyes wide as the Maori slapped his thighs with his massive hands, calling out again in his language. I think... is he challenging them? The Maori bellowed in a lyrical way while slamming his hands onto his thighs in rhythm. What in the... Helena muttered, looking from Limic to Vitka. The only response she got was two pairs of shoulders shrugging. The other humans seemed to actually shrink back from the Maori's words, their hands lightly resting on the torques around their necks. Now the human began to rhythmically stomp and slap his chest with his hands, eyes wide and breathing heavily as he bellowed out to the humans of which he shared land and heritage. Kore matue fanau ki te mau meka meka. The Maori bellowed, stomping and pounding his chest and arms with his hands. He aha koe tuko e iene faki apania to wa e wua. The Maori reached as he stomped, puffed out his cheeks, and even at one point protruded his tongue in a broad manner which caused Limic to raise his eyebrows. From his belt he pulled a waheka carved from copperbite wood, steel shot at the tips and glaring brightly with a fine edge. Kite haere makoto kite fifie ha mako e koito waye wa e hi ere noa. The Maori boomed, holding his weapon high in the air. Makuko e tuku atuete. Tamaya o ene picona. To punctuate his challenge, the human exhaled loudly, staring wide eyed at the humans on the other side of the battlefield. These humans seemed to have had the fight ripped out of them and looked down at the ground, heads hung. Well, that was something. Helena said quietly, Vitka nodding her head rapidly in response. The human that had spoken to Helena pulled out a horn from a sling on his shoulder and blew into it from beside the Maori, the tone low, rumbling, and foreboding. The other human beside the one who had spoken to Helena earlier bore a thick-looking hunting spear in his hand, contrasting the huge war axe borne by the other, and began to thump the end of it onto the ground. As he did, the human Helena had spoken to began to sing, his voice carrying out into the dark. The infantry behind them all began to pound the butts of their pole arms onto the ground, or hammer their shields with their weapons in unison with the spear-wielding human. Helena did not know the words of this either, as it appeared to be in a human language, but the overall feeling felt less alien to her. This feels far more familiar. Helena said with an almost amused laugh, looking over to Vitka. Vitka, who seemed to be staring wide-eyed at the singing son of Odin, was fully poofed out from the adrenaline kicking up in her veins, and she looked at Helena excitedly. Normal war? This spear and shield? Looks like it. Limic said, though he seemed far less keen on this prospect. Eldahinda jogged back over to them as the battle line began to all thunder in unison their challenge, stomping or using their weapons to keep time. Mortars are shifting and will be opening fire shortly. The human changed his verse, and the spear-wielding son of Odin, as well as the Maori, began to sing with him. Are we just supposed to sit here and let them come to us? Limic asked, holding his last grenade to his chest as if it were a kitten. Eldahinda nodded, blowing loose strands of hair out of her face. Aye, they're going to get absolutely fucked on the way in. Then they'll crush upon us. After that, it's whoever can maintain cohesion the best. 
I'd be lying if I said I didn't prefer this old-fashioned way of doing things. Helena said, walking sideways along the trench line to get a better view of the approach. Everyone else walked along with her, joining the rest of the auxiliaries who were all lined together, bayonets flashing in the fires that raged around them. I'd be lying if I said this wouldn't be a great time for a machine gun, Limick growled, looking up and down the line of infantry. All mines. The mortars thumped to life some yards behind them, high explosive mortar shells howling over them at a high arc. When they came down, the enemy was illuminated by the brief flashes of light, then swallowed by torn earth. A horn from the fey-aligned forces bellowed, and a line surged forward to cross no man's land. The sons of Odin and the Maori did not move from the very front of the line, still singing. Helena realized with a start that not only was the Maori's many tattoos giving off a light black glow, but the steel of the weapons of the other two humans were beginning to smolder with what looked like heat. Let them taste our steel, lads! A captain called out from the line of infantry, and a great cry rang out into the air as hundreds of pikes, halberds, and autoglaves leveled down the wall of gleaming steel. Helena closed her eyes and could feel the thousands of boots vibrating the ground as the charge closed, and she exhaled through her nose as she opened her eye. Just like old times. Best of times! Vitka said happily, then opened her mouth to let out her Himalaya battle cry while surging up into the air. The axe-bearing human's voice suddenly surged in volume as he began to finish his song, the fires raging around them in the edge of the city and burning vehicles seeming to grow along with it. Despite what she had thought moments ago, Helena now observed all the infantry suddenly swell with energy or refined purpose. Eyes sparked with vibrant inner fire, weapons glittered ever brighter in the flame light, and all of the auxiliary riflemen lunged out of their fighting positions to form a proper wall of bayonets. Everyone was moving to join in line with the humans, marching forward to present nothing but the edge of their weapons to their charging foe. Humans can't cast magic, right? Helena asked with an unsure tone, tilting her head to Makarat. Makarat looked as alarmed as Helena as she quickly clicked her bayonet into place. Do you think? Maybe they're using what? Starla. Helena breathed out. Then her ears perked as she heard the whistling of arrows coming down from the sky. Dragonflight 1 Still can't see down into the main base defense line. Fibbin said dourly as Groon banked right, Gilly tight to his wing. They must have some pretty strong barriers lit up if we can't even see what's going on in the city. Groon tilted his head to look over his left wing, and down below the city glittered with lights, fires, but he could see nothing more beside that, as if all the vehicles and people had been whisked away completely. Must be using it to mask their movements under a certain level of flight. We may have to come in super low and slow to get rounds on target. We're two minutes from the artillery line, Fibbin said, rapidly checking her map and the screens on the dash as the gremlin fed her information. Start our run. Gilly, time to shine. Stick tight to my wing and only break if tracers start coming your way. Remember, the screaming, beeping noise means you have a missile on you and you need to pop the flares. Groon said into his mic, cutting the engines down to almost nothing. Cut your engines and follow my dive. They'll never see or hear us coming until it's too late. Dragonflight 1 through trail bellies is 2 through 10. Pop flares and get the fuck out of there. Fibbin called out into her mic, her face contorting as Groon started to dive, her stomach lurching uncomfortably. Copy Dragonflight 1. Five out. A voice called back over the radio, and down below them along the sea of dark treetops, a single white flare pierced the gloom. More flares began to hiss into the sky, a ragged line along the trees forming and casting crackling white light onto the green canopies. Fibbin gritted her teeth as Groon still dove and watched as tracers began licking into the trees from the artillery line. The radio exploded with noise as voices of all kinds bursted into her ears. They're firing! Scatter! Scatter! 
shotguns. Humans have shotguns. Eight is down. I grab eight. Go, go, go. A singular orange flare flew into the sky from far on the left, and Groon gritted his teeth as he clicked on his mic. Soup, you see that, right? I see it. Already starting my dies. Soup said, her signature suddenly lurching to the side from Fibbin's screen. I'm not slowing down, though. I'll be in the open. Get ready to drop the first canister on the dive. When I start to really pull up, I'm going to be hammering down on the gun in short bursts, Groon said, flicking his eyes to Fibbin. Make sure the gremlin gets a good drop. Fibbin nodded, pressing square buttons on the rigged flight dash screens in front of her. I have it set up for one canister per pickle press. Remember, we don't have a lot of ammunition. Save some for the supply depot. We'll still be nose heavy when we reach the end. We'll gain a little altitude, then do a run over the city, Groon grunted. The flare's now only a thousand feet below them. Canister out! Gilly called out, the silver torpedo-like device dropping just past Fibbin's view. Fibbin turned to look at Groon, then nodded. Canister out. Increased throttle. Groon said calmly, his thumb pressing down on the bright red pickle switch on his joystick and then releasing it quickly. Groon began both pulling back on the joystick and increasing the A-37's airspeed, a combination that made Fibbin exhale wetly and clutch her stomach. Oh no. We shouldn't have eaten the ranger bar. Fibbin groaned, holding one hand to her stomach and the other to her mouth. Keep your biscuits under control, Fibbin. Groon growled out with a grin, the second flare passing under them by only inches. Canister out. Canister out. Gilly called back, his A-37 almost wing to wing now with Groon's. I've got them in my sights now. Barriers are keeping things hidden around rooftop level. Hide the bodies, not the holes they hide in. Soup said, the rumbling thunder of a rotary gun barely audible in the background of her mic. Groon began pulling back on the stick harder now that the first canister splashed onto the ground, illuminating everything with its yellow and orange glow. Canister out. Fibbin, how many do we have left? Fibbin watched the A-37's wings wobble unnervingly as the large cans of dragon fire were dropped. Full lift. After that, you'll just have your gun. And maybe you can bonk someone with the fuel tank? Groon chuckled as he began really laying on the throttle, their dive almost halfway complete. Canister out. Canister out. You should see the forest behind us. Gilly called out excitedly. Groon narrowed his eyes as Fibbin turned in her seat. He glanced at her and saw in the reflection of her eyes that he did not need a visual to know what flavor of hell those below were savoring. Canister out. Gilly, wait a little bit and strike that last flare. I'm going for the depot. Grin murmured darkly. The forest now bathed in firelight. Copy. Gilly said, his A-37 slowing down behind Groon's. They're burning. My god, they're all burning. Fibbin said quietly, watching as one of the canisters landed with a rippling, roaring explosion that engulfed everything it touched with eager flame. The inferno seeming to pour along the ground a distance like hungry, fiery cream. I can see the shadows of their guns. The human they call Gremlin told us how to make it. They call it napalm. Groon said to her, squinting through a mark on the windscreen as he lined up his gun run on the faintly lit supply dump. We realized it was similar to Dragonfire, so we decided to mix the two. Will their death be quick? Fibbin asked him, still turned in her flight seat. Groon breathed in deep, watching soldiers down below running around as clearly as he could see ants running around the ground near his boots. No. Fibbin spun around in her seat as Groon held down the trigger. The rotary gun began to spin, then fire, throwing a stream of purple tracers down into the supply depot. Groon was worried he would need to drop one of the last two canister bombs, but was rewarded with a sudden explosion near the end of his long burst. 
The figures in front of his reticle were illuminated in light and shadow as something within the supply depot exploded, setting off multiple chain reaction explosions that threw debris in long, bright streaks through the air. That'll do, Groon said to Fibbin, then turned on his mic. Gilly, Soup, link back up with me. We'll do a run down the city. Already coming in on your five. Soup said back, and within seconds her A-37 was lagging just behind Groon's tail. Gilly appeared a few seconds later, his craft only bearing one canister. Get a little excited, did we? Groon asked a dwarf, turning and setting a course for over the City of Oars. Not quite. Saw a bunch of vehicles parked and decided to give them a bath. Gilly said with a chuckle. Tracer! Soup called out, and Groon jerked away from the cockpit glass as a long string of tracers rattled into the sky. Keep speed, Groon said, then steadily lost altitude until the city's true image popped into view. Hot damn. Fibbin leaned forward in her seat as the glowing wrecks of tanks, armored vehicles, and tracers suddenly filled their view. Soldiers scattered all over the place ran or fired at other figures, while tanks trundled forwards on both sides, seeking their targets. How in Skipira did they mean it to hold the city? Fibbin breathed, her eyes wide as the three A-37 streaked over the rooftops. Groon pointed his free hand towards the eastern side of the city, by taking all the spare ammunition from them. Fibbin jerked her head up and saw that on the opposite side of Oars, an immense melee battle was raging, illuminated by the burning buildings and wrecked vehicles scattered all over the firebase. With a start, Fibbin pointed down at a wreck in particular. Cobra! They got a cobra on the ground! Gilly. Soup. Those orcs and southern elves look cold down there. Groom murmured into his mic, applying rudder and angling himself towards the rear edge of the fight. Don't drop too close to the middle. Our troops may be mixed in. Fibbin, get me cartwheel. Allow me. Soup piped up and surged ahead, applying all her throttle. This little lady has to lose some weight, and I know just who can hold it for me. Helena released the string on her bow, the last of her arrows given to her by Boone flying true and straight. It punched through the skull of the last Maori humans dueling with the Maori, who had began to clutch the several bloody torques in his free hand as he collected them. Eldahinda, I'm dry! Helena called out, running along the pulsing battle line towards the dwarfess. I'm gonna have to go blades! Elda Henda wrenched her blades free from the stomach of an orc who was too slow to block her, his spear dropping from his fist as he gargled out in alarm. Yeah, well it's about time you joined the rest of us, Elf. Helena saw the orc reach down to pull a knife from his fur-lined leather and chainmail armor, and pulled out the broad fighting great knife she had found on the ground earlier during the battle. Knife! Eldahinda's eyes flashed as the orc pulled the blade free, going to grab her by the hair with his bloody fist. Without hesitation, Eldahinda lunged forward and snatched up the orc's wrist and her teeth, her blades too low to catch the arm in time. Helena lunged into the air with the blade and brought it down, cleaving the orc's exposed neck and opening the pearly spine to the night air. Eldahinda leaned away from the collapsing body of the orc and spat pulling a face as she stuck out her tongue in disgust. Oh, that's awful. I got some of the cuff water in my mouth. Where's Limic? Helena asked her, quickly turning around in a circle and looking for anyone else who had pushed through the battle line. Elda Hinda gestured with a gore-covered blade as she spat. He's over there messing about with a flare. Kept saying something about a radio or whatever. Helena turned in time to see Limic pop an arcing purple flare into the sky then pick up what would look to be a bundle of grenades all bound together. Why is he launching a flare into the sky? Won't that attract the other cobras? Hell, I don't know, Helena. Eldahinda breathed out in exhaustion, sitting down with a grunt on the cooling corpse of the orc. The line is barely holding as it is. At what point is a cobra really going to change anything except speed up the inevitable? Helena held a blade in both her hands after slinging the bow over her back, looking around rapidly. We're holding our center. 
The Maori has killed off most of the tattooed humans, and the Odin humans are currently chopping things up. We can hold this. Helena startled backwards as a sudden rapid chorus of shuckin reports cracked out near the back of the enemy line. The sounds somehow peeking over the sounds of steel ringing on steel. Harpies began falling from the sky, landing with a crack of broken bones onto the ground. Himalaya and sparrow harpies that were lucky enough to only get winged fluttered down to the ground in heaps, crawling or limping away from the battle line as quickly as they could. Vitka was one of the harpies who managed to land on both her feet with a bit of a struggle and limped towards Helena and Elda Henda. Helena, healing! Vitka needs healing! Vitka cried out, both of her wings sagging so heavily that her shoulder and neck muscles were bulging with the strain. Vitka is hurt. Aldehinda! Helena shouted, running over and dropping her shoulder under Vitka's wing. Aldehinda, Vitka's hurt. Do you have any potions? Aldehinda rummaged around in her side pouches as she stood up, jogging over to Vitka and Helena as she pulled out a small healing potion the size of her thumb. Not unsubstantial, just my backup. Vitka's face dropped at the sight of such a small healing potion, her knees struggling to not buckle under the multiple pellet wounds. That all? That all healing? That's all the healing, I'm afraid. Elda Henda said gravely, twisting the wax-covered cork and then popping it off with her fingers. This can keep you alive, but not much else. There is more coming, Helena. Vitka murmured through the small drought of potion Elda Henda dipped past her lips. Hundreds more coming. Hundreds? Helena asked, narrowing her eyes. Do you mean like 100, 200? Many hundreds. Vitka sighed out, and finally her knees gave. Helena handed Vitka off to Elda Henda, who bundled the harpy onto her own shoulders in a fireman's carry. I'll take her to the healers. They're going to be gas, but it'll be the closest point to the evacuation vehicles. Elda Henda grunted, hefting a moaning, blood-soaked Vitka onto her shoulders. I'll be back when I drop her off. I'll be here. Helena said with a nod, and Elda Henda nodded back before taking off at a low jog. Helena turned around towards the chaotic battle lines, taking in the sounds of random autoglave fire, the screams of the wounded, and the frenzied yelling of the able. At least I hope I'll be here. I'll try and be here. Helena muttered to herself, stepping around those dragging wounded soldiers from the line and making her way into the fray. Helena stationed herself around a group of heavily armed guards who were acting as a buffer for the three human combat leaders, and had just begun to raise her blade when an odd whistling roar caught her long ears. Not again. There's no way it's back. Helena groaned, turning in a circle as she scanned the sky. Her nerves shot to cold ice when she spied six silvery objects falling from the sky. Then the roar of a jet engine streaking overhead almost knocked her to the ground from how hard she backpedaled from the sound. Whatever it was, it was so low in the air that Helena actually caught it on its climb, the engines glowing as her ears rang painfully. What was that? Helena shouted, looking to the other confused line soldiers around her. Then night turned into day. And that's the end of chapter 14 for section 222. If you enjoyed the story and you like the story, please comment down below. If you give me nothing, at least give me a comment. If it's a bad comment or a good comment, constructive comment, whatever, just leave me a comment. Garbro likes his comments. All right. Now, if you really, really enjoyed the stories and you want to see more stories like this, such as the upcoming book two of Emily Bronze, uh, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. And please donate to the copy. If I just got a dollar, I'd be happy. If every viewer gave me one dollar, I'd be content. I'd be like, yep, good, good enough for me. Because that way, I can put all that money towards the VAs. I want to keep the VAs happy, and VAs like money. <laughs> that is what it is. Uh, as well, check out the um, Redcon 1 store for protein powder, supplements, testosterone pills, etc., etc. They have them all there. As well, in case you were curious, there is a TTRPG game that is actually made from this series. Uh, it's currently going on, it's probably on Kickstarter late January. And it's a 
TTRPG game. It's not D&D 5e. It's not a D&D supplement. It's not OSR. This bitch is completely original in my opinion. From its action point system to how it throws grenades, it's an RPG game you can play with your friends and be an elf with machine guns. You know what it is. And now to address those who have a membership with Garbro's Field Desk. Now, memberships work in tiers. There's the first shirt, the E4 Mafia, and then Snuffy Squad. And what the memberships do is it gives me an idea of how much money I'm going to make per month, and you guys donate per month for certain perks. Those perks can be, like, such as the first shirt, get an entire page of the next chapter in advance. They had a whole chapter of the read-through. Not a whole chapter, a whole page of the read-through of the chapter. And then the E4 Mafia gets a paragraph. They get a, a chosen paragraph from a um, place in the book that they are able to read ahead. And then Snuffy Squad gets a funny passage, usually. I uh, try and keep it at least somewhat um, teaserish or funny or, I don't know, smutty, whatever <laughs> it may be. But these tiers and memberships allow those of you to support the channel uh, more consistently. And I do appreciate those who always use the memberships. As well, there are discount codes with the memberships for buying stuff. On the coffee page, um, you get a little uh, rank that shows what you are in, in the Discord chat and other stuff like that. But as for our first shirt, these guys give 50 bucks per month, and that'll be Thusala, Doppy X, Insane Medic, Para, and Ranger Uninspired. Thank you guys so much for giving what you're giving. It mostly goes <laughs> to the VAs, but uh, I really do appreciate y'all keep, keeping the VAs paid, really. It, it, it helps out a lot. And then there's the E4 Mafia, like the Aryan Z, Noah Freeman, Flash of Green, Josh Beatty, and Crusader 0625. All ups to the E4 Mafia. And then there's Snuffy Squad, and these are the guys give $5 per month. I appreciate all of you, I really do. Um, just thank you, especially the guy who's given $150 and $5 bills so far. That's fucking insane. <laughs> thank you, bud. Anywho. Until we see you next time on this side of the veil, that was Eliza, that was RB Sounds, that was Amanda, that was Dusty Parch, our senior VA, the Sweet Bell Dam, that was Vin, that was Fire, that was Danger, and this is Garbro's Field Desk. We'll see you next time.